Happy Sunday. It truly is a cold Sunday, but a glorious Sunday. Today's message is titled, Giving Thanks. I'm sure that most of us find it easy to give God the glory when things are going smoothly. I try to do that several times a day. This week was particularly fraught full of thanking, giving praise to the Lord. I made a journey out to Buffalo again to do some repairs in fields of trade that I have no clue of or very little clue of, and I had Jesus, the HVAC tech, Jesus, the electrician, Jesus, the plumber, and Jesus, the AAA travel God with me. I came back through a whiteout in Utica, smelt a little bit of rubber, and when I got home, I noticed that one of my bald tires was flat. He got me home. Praise God flowed freely from my lips and frequently. But then there are those days when the train derails and the cars seem to pile up right behind it, and it's a little bit harder. But then I try and look back at some of the weapons that I use to go against Satan when he comes at me. I mentioned them in last year's message at Thanksgiving. I have a Thanksgiving card that I look at. and It has all those things listed on it that the Lord has done for myself and my family from all those good th- things that happened. And I look over them, and I, and I re- remember that that's something that no one can take away. These are thanksgiving praises to the Lord that I remind myself of. And you all are on this card because you're my family, and there's some of you that are out there that are on this card as well. I also mentioned how there's hope and what awaits us, those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, when this life is over. It's a beautiful blessing of promise that in Jesus Christ we will live forever and there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more heartache. And then, of course, there's today. Today when we can fellowship as a family, and bounce our hurts off of each other and be crutches at some times for each other. That's what we have family for. And a family in God is a lot stronger together than they are apart. This is, however, not a repeat message of last year's message of Thanksgiving because that wouldn't do justice to the Holy Spirit, what he gave me today. I will, however, repeat the dictionary definition of Thanksgiving as it's found when you Google Thanksgiving, the noun. Number one, it's the expression of gratitude, especially to God. You can Google it. God is still in there. They haven't taken him out yet. But it's an expression of thanksgiving to God. The second definition, in North America, an annual national holiday marked by religious observances and a traditional meal, including a turkey. The holiday commemorates a harvest festival celebrated by the pilgrims in 1621, and it is held in the U.S. on the fourth Thursday in November. A similar holiday is held in Canada, usually on the second Monday of October. These Christian pilgrims set aside time to remember that it was God who provided that bountiful harvest. These Christians, a couple of generations later, would form a nation under God and indivisible, indivisible because of God. Because whenever God is with us, he cannot be separated from us. That's a promise. And just so that we're clear, they instituted all their laws and all their decrees based upon God's word. 
everything came from the way God wanted it to be. That's how our nation was founded. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, all based upon God's word. They even protected those beliefs by saying that there would be no government interference. There would be no jurisdiction of the government in the church. Hence, separation of church and state. It was to protect the church, not like happens today where the church, the government is being protected from the church. That's not the way it was designed. It was designed to protect those of us who love the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to be free from interference in our worship of him. Our founders faced many difficulties, but they flourished because of God's word. And so I would like to think that some of these passages that we will go through today gave them peace in their times of trouble. Our first one is in Colossians, Colossians 3. It's going to be page 1,167 of your pew Bible, 1,167, and that's Colossians 3, 1,167, Colossians 3, and we'll start in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Scripture tells us to not go at it alone, to go at it with fellow believers. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Scripture tells us to be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do all to the glory of God. That means in our daily lives when we work or when we are at home, we should be trying to be the best employee or the best parent and doing everything to the praise and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15 tells us if we do that, the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts. This is a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it comes because of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to the Lord even in scary times. That's why I've mentioned this before. I used to have next to my bed an index card with Philippians 4, 6 through 7 on it. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which is on page... 1,163, just back up a four, four pages, 1,163, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And I would read this card at night when I would have the same reoccurring worries that would plague my mind about some event that might happen tomorrow. And it says, fear not, but with prayer and supplication, let your thoughts be And thanksgiving, let your thoughts be made known to God and the peace and understanding that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind 
in Christ Jesus. With prayer and thanksgiving, let your thoughts be made known. And God promises the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. It's a promise, and it can't be taken. And to be thankful even when things go bad, not only when things go good. God tells us this in, through Paul in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, which is on page 1171. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, he's speaking to believers only. He's not speaking to the unsaved world whenever he starts a message with brothers and sisters. We, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, he tells us. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for us is that we thank him in all circumstances, not only when times are good. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. He's given us an outline on what's good and what's evil. He says, test them. Is this of my word? If it's not of my word, reject it. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, he says. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he is saying, be kept blameless. That's somebody else doing the keeping. That's not of our own energy. God is keeping us protected. He's keeping us blameless in Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He reiterates, he will be there. He will keep you as his own in Jesus Christ. That's worth thanks in itself. God also wants us to be thankful because we have already become immortal. The moment we believed on Jesus Christ for our salvation, we were seated in the heavenlies. And at the moment we take our last breath, we will immediately be present with the Lord. That is our promise. And he also tells us that we might actually never even have to take our last breath. Let's follow me to the scripture that points to this. 1 Corinthians 15. We should be thankful that we might not even have to have a last breath. Page 1140, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Flesh and blood, the way we are now, cannot be in the presence of God because we're sin nature filled. We're dirty. We're only pure because of Jesus Christ. So when we do stand before God, when we do hear those seven words from Jesus Christ saying, well done, my good and faithful servant, we can't do it in this body. It has to be cleansed. It has to be purified. We have to have that new body. 
because this is perishable, this body. We will be clothed in the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery, he says. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. That's something we have as hope that we can give thanks to God for every moment of the day when we get beaten down because we have the glory in God. Death has no sting for us. The sting of death is sin, it tells us, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us from God, be thankful to God because he gives us the victory now already. He's not going to give us the victory. Scripture says he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It says, be of good cheer and everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord because you've already won. You've already become incorruptible in God's eyes. You've already become imperishable in God's eyes. You've already become pure in God's eyes because of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says that we should be thankful for the fact that we cannot be shaken. We are built on the immovable solid rock. God's consuming wrath will never touch us. We find that in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 18, bottom of page 1193. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. This happened at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. The people were not allowed to touch the mountain. A voice from heaven came down and said, don't even let your animals touch this heaven, uh, this mountain. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. That's the heavenly kingdom. The heavenly Jerusalem, it tells us. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to spirits of righteousness made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It says a better word than the blood of Abel. God avenged Abel um, by cursing Cain. God avenged Jesus by cursing non-believers. It's a more better word, if that's even a sentence. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens, God tells us. 
The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so what so that what cannot be shaken may remain. We are what cannot be shaken. Scripture tells us those in Christ cannot be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. It tells us we're protected from the wrath of God because we're his own. To thank God for that. Over and over, Scripture tells us that those in Christ will never see the wrath of God. And Scripture tells us in several places that those who don't seek God and who don't accept Christ as the only way, the only truth, and the only life, they actually cannot be thankful to God. They get what they want. Their non-belief will be strengthened, their hearts hardened, and the ability to be thankful to God taken away from them. Romans 1 is very clear on this. Romans 1.18, found on the bottom of page 1,112. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without an excuse. People are without an excuse if they look at this planet and the stars and the heavens and think that this all just happened by accident. When people stand by and maybe witness the birth of a child or the birth of an animal, that surely is not a mistake. That is not an evolution. It's not a coincidence. Neither is a cockroach turning into Albert Einstein. That's not possible. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened, it tells us. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. They worship the creation instead of the creator. So scripture tells us their hearts were darkened. They rejected God so long that they had no hope outside of people praying for them. I have to emphasize that because we all know somebody who might have strayed a little bit from God or who might have difficulty with situations in life and be angry with God even. This is not speaking of them because in John 14, 13, God tells us anything that you ask for in my name to the glory of the Father, I will do. And he repeats it. It's not God's will that any should perish. So once again, all we have to do is put them in our hearts and prayers and let God take it from there. He's not speaking about these people, our loved ones who haven't quite gotten there yet. He's speaking about the ones who hate God on purpose. And he's going to help them along. In Revelation, we are told 
The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, or wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. They did not repent of them, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. This is during the tribulation, no repentance. And then that was Revelation 9 and 16. It tells us something else. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify him. They knew where this was coming from. They knew that their punishment was coming from God and they shaked their fists at him. They cursed him. They could do no other. Verse 10, it says, The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. This goes over and over and over in Scripture. From the skies, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on the people. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. They were able to know that God was inflicting this on them, but they hated him so long that they had no choice but to continue cursing him. Job tells us, Distress and anguish fill him with terror. Troubles overwhelm him like a king poised to attack because he shakes his fist at God and vaunts himself against the Almighty. These are all scriptures that actually give me hope. Not for those that are perishing. None should perish. But it gives me peace in knowing that I'm not at that stage. God hasn't hardened my heart. God still lets me be thankful to him. God still helps me to praise and worship him as he does with all of his children. He is the fuel for our salvation. I don't want anyone to have to suffer like that. That's why I will speak boldly about the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe someone will hear it and want to know more about this Jesus. Until then, I will continue to praise him and thank him. Those people that we read about were just the fools, as written in Roman 1. They worshipped social justice, the planet, the slaughter of innocents, those who praised gender dysphoria, and they even hailed Satan himself. Those are the people that find themselves entrenched in a world of hopelessness. In Revelation, they had to take the mark on purpose. Now, we will not be there in the Revelation, in the tribulation, Scripture tells us. But they had to take the mark of the beast. They had to sign up for devil's plans. It was not forced upon them. And that makes sense because their hearts were darkened because of their hatred of God. I give thanks over and over that I'm a child of God. I won't be deceived. I will always be protected in the honesty of truth that's found in the words. And today's message ends with the greatest act of thanksgiving to God that has ever been performed. That's the thankfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to be humiliated, spat on, slapped, whipped, scourged, 
pierced, nailed to a Roman cross, suffocating and bleeding out, and then finally to be forsaken by God himself. Jesus Christ thanked God for what was about to happen to him so that it doesn't happen to us. It says he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he said, take and drink, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Take and drink. He gave thanks to God to be able to take the place for us, to take the punishment that we deserve as a righteous lamb slain. Giving thanks to God is a privilege. It's something that we have been given. It's something that promises us hope. God says he will give us the peace that surpasses all understanding if we just come to him and ask him. Let our thoughts be made known to him with thankfulness. Lord, sometimes I forget to thank you, especially when times are good. I sometimes take the credit myself, and I forget that it was you who made it all happen. And sometimes when things are bad, I get caught yelling, why, Lord, why? But that's not the way it is. Remind me in those times when things go all too smoothly, that it was you that was my force field protecting me from outside dangers that could have happened. And when things go bad, remind me that you're there with me, that you're crying with me, that you're hurt with me, that your heart is broken with mine. In all things, Lord, let me do what is right in your eyes and remind me to thank you through it for all circumstances. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.